I would like to renew my thank to uh, the Luma Foundation for hosting us today um, for these, uh, these talks, and especially um, Maya Hoffman, uh, Anna and uh, Friedrich that I see there. Thank you. <laughs> and, their, and their great team um, that have been taking care of like, um, yeah, organizing the technique and everything since, um, for today and uh, since weeks. Um, also, um, uh, the city of Zurich and Mirabeau for, for their support. And, and especially our guests um, who came uh, um, for some, uh, some of them a long way uh, to be here today. Um, and um, Thomas, thank you for being here today. Um, welcome. Um, dear Professor Clavien, thank you also for making it. And, um, and Finn Canonica um, will, will moderate this talk. Um, Finn is um, editor-in-chief of uh, the, the Swiss publication Das Magazine. Thank you and um, have a good talk. Well, um, <laughs> uh, hello everybody, thank you for being here. This is the last installment of this art and science talk. Uh, well, she made a, a short introduction of my guests. I, I'm going to repeat it and say a little bit more. This is uh, to my uh, right, Professor uh, Pierre-Alain Clavien. He's professor and director of the Department of Surgery and Transplantation at the University Hospital of Zurich. Um, Mr. Clavien shows his excellence in two fields. He is recognized as one of the most, uh, one of the top surgeons. Plus, he is a uh, world-class scientist uh, undertaking research since decades on the regeneration of organs. And he has won numerous prizes during his very rich career. And someone, uh, half an hour before this talk started, sent me a, a text that he wrote more than 600 research papers, which you <laughs> declined, is not true, no. but uh, many, <laughs> many research papers at least. <laughs> then uh, we have uh, Thomas Hirschhorn. Uh, for those who are familiar in the art world, he doesn't need an introduction. Nevertheless, let me say a few words about Thomas. He's a world-famous Swiss artist. He's an extremely energetic artist. I, I, saw, uh, I saw him talking two or three days ago, uh, it's in, in a very interesting talk about uh, the Robert Walzer sculpture. Um, he's an installation artist whose works address social political issues. Um, here, Sean has developed his own visual language in which uh, the world of politics, society and commerce um, collide, leading to his current practice of presence and uh, production projects. Uh, Thomas studied at the School of Design and Art in Zurich. His works ha have been featured in numerous exhibitions, including the Venice Biennale, and he will be um, awarded with the Prix Mere Oppenheim this Monday in, in Basel. So a very well, uh, warm applause for the two. And then we'll start with... Um, We'll start with a presentation by Thomas Hirschhorn, followed by a presentation by um, Professor Clavien. And then I, I hope that we immediately will talk about, uh, you talk with each other about, uh, about your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte, for this invitation. Uh, thank you, Finn. Thank you, Professor, to be here. So in order uh, to make this um, uh, for me, truthful, uh, I want just uh, to address you, Professor, uh, some ideas of my work and also uh, a recent work which I did, uh, I wanted to share it with you. So the work is called, What Can I Learn From You? What Can You Learn From Me? Uh, before, I want to tell you that to me, art is a tool. It's a tool to encounter the world. It's a tool. So to me, art is a tool to encounter the world. I see art as a tool to confront reality. And also, I see art as a tool to live in the time I'm living in. Myself, I choose uh, to put my work always in the form and force field of love politics, aesthetic, and philosophy. There are other form and force fields, like nature, like gender. My form and force field is love, politics, aesthetics, and philosophy. Always, when I do a work of art, it must touch all of them. Not equally, 
but all of them. Um, as Finn mentioned, uh, I developed a kind of work I call presence and production works, uh, beside uh, a work in exhibition, in galleries, in art spaces, uh, and also in the street production. Presence and production which means essentially I am present and I'm producing something. I do, did in 2003 uh, uh, a work in Kassel here, uh, a presence and production work for 100 days where I was on the spot 100 days. Uh, I did a presence and production work with residents of a small city close to Paris in Aubervilliers called Musée Precaire Albine. Uh, presence and production projects I can also do inside in an institution like this for 24 hours Foucault. This was only 24 hours in Paris in the Palais de Tokyo. I did a work called Swiss Swiss uh, Democracy 2004 in the Swiss um, uh, Cultural Center in Paris where I was there all the time for 54 days. I made a work uh, in Amsterdam in the suburb of Bilmer. The Bilmer, it's called the Bilmer Spinoza Mon uh, uh, Festival. Uh, it was in 2006 together with the residents. I, uh, I was there for uh, two and a half months <coughs> all the time. Uh, recently, uh, uh, I made a work called the Gramsci Monument 2013. It was in the South Bronx together with residents also. Uh, uh, 77 days alone. And I made again here uh, uh, followed an invitation in Palais de Tokyo in Paris. Uh, this was a work in the institution but also following this presence and production for uh, 54 days in 2014. Uh, you know, Professor, that we are working with an institution called Museum. I am working with museums. I'm not working for museums or against museums. It's tricky sometimes as an artist to deal with museums because uh, there are a lot of things uh, who could be criticized. For example, the Jews of the artist museum shows or for example, that you have to pay to enter or for example, that uh, the entrance hour are not in on love, uh, not in on. So um, there is, um, um, uh, a, a kind of a big uh, questioning always, I think, for me as an artist working with an institution. But to me, it's clear I'm working with them, not against them, but also not for them. So I'm always on the edge of this. And also, to me personally, I love a museums because it's through a museum, through, by the way, the Kunsthaus Zurich, that I, who was not, who was not coming from a family who art plays a role where they did the first encounter with art. So the invitation and the work I wanted to share with you was came from an institution from the Museum Remain Modern in Saskatoon, in Canada. It's a very brand new museum. It's just opened um, in, the last, in the end of the last day. And by the way, the curator, the chief curator and the chief and head of programs <coughs> Sandra Guimaraes is here. She invited me, together with the director, to do uh, presence and production. So Saskatoon is uh, the main town, even when it's not the capital, of the region Saskatchewan, in the middle of, uh, of, uh, of Canada. Uh, there are living a little bit more than one million people in this huge region, which is bigger than France. Um, um, it's a prairie. It's very flat. It's a prairie. And there is one particular thing that about 15% of the people, of the population, are First Nations or Aboriginals or Natives. Uh, and a lot of them are living in Saskatoon or in the area. This is the city, Sask Saskatoon. Uh, there are about 350,000 uh, people. It's uh, quite a very uh, modern city where this museum is situated. Um, so, in order to build my presence and production project in Saskatoon, I did field work. I call it field work. It's just out go to the field and to try to encounter the residents there, the people who are living there. It's quite easy. I, I, went, uh, I went to associations, I went to structures 
who take care of inhabitants or, uh, or people who have uh, uh, problems or uh, you have to care, like, like um, for example, Salvation Army, like all kind of cultural center, like drug help center, etc. And always I try to, to engage a dialogue to, 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 to meet uh, the people of, of the city. One of the very strong encounters I had is in this space. It's uh, called Friendship Inn. It's uh, in, this, in the city of Saskatoon, a place where you can eat for free. And when I was there, I, it was like a visual shock because almost all the people were First Nation people. And it was to me, um, um, uh, it was to me, I, I, I get visually aware that there is a, a huge problem, of course, and also something non-resolved that uh, this population, the First Nation people, had had to had to struggle with. Uh, just one sh one uh, one uh, uh, shift, uh, one uh, number. About four, <coughs> only four percent of the population in Canada are First Nation, and about twenty-three percent uh, of this population make the population in the in the in the prisons over there. So that means there is really um, there is really a trauma people had to confront. So I show this because what should I do there? Discovering it quite very fresh there and also when I made twice a fieldwork for uh, two weeks, uh, there was I had no really uh, uh, of course no really uh, in a way uh, uh, authorization from myself to deal with this. So uh, the only way to do something is uh, in an universal way to address the population, the people in an universal -like way. And therefore I decided to do what I call a critical workshop. Critical because it's, it's good to criticize. It's also a critique, for example, of the institution there. And also it's in a critical moment between life and death. So then I decided, in this critical, I decided several points. For example, there will be this workshop for, uh, from January to February. So this happened in this year, in January and February. Then there will be a workshop space in a museum dedicated to this. Then every day from 10 to 5, the opening hour of the museums, twice it was longer in the museum, uh, I will, this workshop will happen, happen. Then it will be free. But all people who came to the workshop had free access to the museum because the other parts of the museum had to pay. Then also I, I negotiated with the, the museum that each teacher who came to teach me something, or to teach us something, get 100 Canadian dollars. And also I, I engaged, of course, that I'm present all the time. And also that it's, of course, free for everybody and everybody's welcome. Then with this flyer, I went back to the, uh, all the as associations and structure, uh, like Salvation Army, because you know what it is, Salvation Army, and also the Friendship Inn, and I tried, it, I tried to invite people uh, to come and to come to the workshop and to share their competence, their knowledge, or their history. This is important to me, because I call it, and this is uh, something I wanted to tell you about the non-exclusive audience. Why I do? Why I go in this and this and these spots? Because to me, as an artist, I think I must direct my work to the other, to the non-exclusive audience, the people who I don't know, the people who has not an interest of art, the people who has other problems than art, the people who is a stranger, perhaps uh, somebody um, uh, in danger. So I think I need to put my energy in this direction. But, of course, uh, I call it a spectrum of evaluation. The institution director, the art critic, the curator, the gallerist, the art historian, the collector, the art professor, they are not excluded because they are touched with the others. But important on this schema is that my energy, my drive has to go in this direction and not in this direction. Because I think when I work only for the spectrum of evaluation, I have no chance anymore to touch the other, the unexpected. So there, therefore, these people I met in Saskatoon. Then something else, 
I, in, in this museum, I wanted to do a, a dedicated space for this workshop, where it happened. So we did the floor, we did the light, we did uh, uh, the, the walls covering with, uh, with elements uh, of my aesthetic. Therefore, in the field, in the uh, force and force field, it's important aesthetics. Because I want to do the work first. So for example, I, I put a lot of tools, I put items to use, like kitchen items. I put also uh, uh, banners <coughs> with uh, phrases I, I, I mentioned, I, I wrote down. Uh, in the discussion before, like what is given to us is meant to be shared, or we are still alive, and also being different is beautiful. So I created the space in order to host this workshop. And then now I want to share uh, how it worked, this critical workshop. What can I learn from you? What can you learn from me? This idea that uh, how can I engage with the other who has another history, another tradition? Uh, how can I engage? So I was thinking just uh, perhaps he or she tells me, learns me something, uh, teaches me something, and also me, eventually I can teach something from my experience. So it had, uh, uh, it, it was one month, about 28 days happened. So what uh, this experience uh, was a very complex, interesting for me. Uh, it was directed to kids, to all the people. What was, what, what was positive to me that people, uh, um, participated in the discussion. Sometimes, uh, mostly in the beginning, there were a few people, only a very few people, sometimes even less people than there to listen. And then, of course, uh, more and more happened. People came and, and more and more people came and, and attended this work. Uh, in the end, <coughs> more than 400 uh, uh, teaching us. The only goal was it has must be a half an hour, a half, if each lesson, if sharing was a half an hour. So now, just to conclude, I wanted to tell you why, uh, to me, presence and production make sense. Uh, of course it makes sense because first it's an engagement of myself. I have to be there all the time. I have nothing else more important to do than to be really there on the spot and to try uh, to produce something. But also then, uh, when you're present and when you are uh, producing something, uh, it's like normal that other people also come because you are already there. Um, and uh, people are coming and, uh, what, and sharing their competence, uh, they are sharing something they know, something they can do. But in this case in Saskatoon, I was struck by how much the people came and told us, me, about the trauma that they had to confront, about the personal history and about uh, the, the struggle now they have to do uh, years after, still years after, with all the outcome, like drugs, etc. What is beautiful to me in a presence and production project, because you are always there, it's addressed to people who have time, like me, I'm there all the time. So. Um, people who are not so occupied uh, because uh, they have either uh, uh, no work or they have uh, no family or they have um, uh, just they are in a disposition to share their time. And just one example is Elizabeth, an older lady, she came almost in the, to the end almost every day. She came, she, she teached and uh, shared with us her, her tradition, but also she listened and she stayed all day when the other, she was also a spectator, when the others, and um, uh, it is very important in this project, uh, like a presence and production project, that there is somebody also who is part of the public. So uh, I was very happy that this woman, uh, for example, also implicated themself in doing tra traduction, for example, then, uh, traducing, uh, somebody who was speaking uh, an Aboriginal language. Or another person who always, always, Jimmy, he's an, uh, uh, an artist who is based in Saskatoon, who developed uh, his own form. And he came every day uh, either to listen, to present uh, what he made uh, just on the spot, and also to use the tools we have there and to share it with us. So this is the, 
this is some, uh, something uh, really particular which can arise with these projects, uh, presence and production, which I would, uh, I would mention as grace. Thank you. Some Thank words you. about my work. Thank you. I think maybe we continue with, uh, with your presentation, Mr. Clavien, and then uh, we try to start the conversation. Well, this is not easy for me to talk <laughs> after uh, Mr. Sichuan. I mean, clearly, I mean, you show passion, you show enthusiasm, commitment, and the first things that I see common with some scientists and us, you want to change the world. It's very ambitious. I mean, you're really going and want to attack the problem where the problem is. And I think that's basically science. You want to go where the problem is, not everywhere when there is no need. I think that was one of the message. You are totally enthusiastic. I mean, this is incredible. I would like to recruit you in my team right away, if I could, right now, to <laughs> do things. Could you do and that in your hospital? But, uh, huh? Could you do that in your hospital, a project well, like this? Well, I mean, this? you know, it's not, it's not just doing the same, but I mean, it's some kind of philosophy. That <laughs> okay. So I will try, uh, no, I don't know if I should even give my talk. I think this is so good, we could just talk, but... Uh, <laughs> I, want to, I want to see what you're doing. Okay, yeah. so I try to... Uh, I really try to do not too long, and it's not so we have time for discussion, because probably the best part we, we can have. So I'm born in Switzerland, in uh, the French part of Switzerland, trained in Geneva. Uh, then I wanted to do surgery, but I went to Basel at that time, then came back, and then Switzerland is very small, and I wanted to learn something different, and I moved to uh, Toronto, then to the US, and then all that by chance, somewhat, or by opportunity. I just put a few slides about the message, what I remember. So I was here in, in Toronto. I did a PhD in Toronto. I spent five years there. Uh, at the end of the training, which is pretty uncommon because I was a surgeon in the typical uh, Swiss where science is not on the top. And then I realized at the end of my training that I did not want to go to work in a small hospital or whatever. I want to do something else. And that means you have to go out of the country. And I went to Toronto. Uh, here, and I just quote here, uh, it was, you, in, in your life, I think an artist probably is the same, but it's very important for scientists, you have mentors, a few people who guide you, who tell you, and then you will remember what they have said, and that push you all your life along. This man, Dr. Bernie Langer, who now is 85, I met him recently, who became an artist, by the way, what he does now is doing some painting, many of those are doing that. That just, I put that, that, you know, rather than to go by success, this is absolutely true even today, and you try to minimize that, but you learn a lot in our field by mistake. You hope not to hurt patients too much, of course, but you learn that. And he was the big surgeon at that time, really uh, impressive, and I remember he had this very modest message and these things that, that you remember uh, later on. Then I moved to Duke University. I put a few slides uh, here. You can see we're a little bit younger in the middle. That was an opportunity the American way. You are 32. In Switzerland, at age 32, you have absolutely no chance in, in, in a hospital to really have any responsibility. In the US, they trust you, at least, at the, the same, and you can go ahead. And I was in charge of the, the starting a liver transplant program uh, here. This picture here on the bottom, uh, I would always remember, that was the first transplant, and we don't see that I did. I transplant the part of the liver of the mother here to uh, the girl. That's what I done much later. She was four years of age when we did that, and they, they took the pictures. He already was five. And here, this is the head of, I mean, this is interdisciplinary, so many different people here. So the uh, first things I think that push you in, in, in research or in medicine is emotion. I mean, you need the emotion to go further and to be somewhat persistent. And here, maybe it fits which what you heard before, uh, that's the research. I will not go in detail. We have a machine to perfuse organ and then try to study what's happening in this organ. And maybe in these pictures, I'm on the right side, and you have here someone from India in the middle from China, and in the back, someone from Brazil. And that was in the US. So first things that you learn in research is that, well, there's not really differences. And we try to minimize that. It's just we have a common view, work on something, and try to get the best. And I think that goes a bit in, in what you were trying to see here. The, and the fellow who is from Brazil was just observer, not with a job, and then we included him, and he ended up to contribute very significantly. Then I um, came back to Zurich, I'll make it short. I had no intention somewhat. I was happy there, but opportunity, so I came back here. 
And very difficult at the challenge, I came back to Zurich, we started speaking very much German, still today is not the best, and I don't understand any Swiss German, and for different reasons, I took these, these uh, challenges in the Department of Surgery, was suffering at that time, a number of problems, so that was to go uh, with this. This is a school, I mean, we like that, we had the reputation here, is Bill Rolls, is one, I mean, a century ago, who was still very well known in surgery, we discovered or invented a number of operations. So you come here and you're recruited to be a surgeon, you need to treat patients, that's your mission. And you will be judged uh, by the others, by whoever, by your ability either to create a team and to treat patients well. And that's something, I just put this, I found that here. Uh, in surgery, in medicine, or in the world, we live a lot with dogma. And the challenge or the role of the surgeon is basically to challenge the dogma to put. And I have here, here this is, that is the world round of flat. And the answer here, I don't want to criticize my colleague, but that's not what they say. What could that possibly have to do with us? <laughs> in other words, I don't care whether it's round or flat. That has absolutely zero influence on my daily life, and I don't want to go for that. And I think the difference for the, the scientists or the one who go further, he cannot, he, he has to care. I mean, we have to go further. And uh, here, I mean, I have a few, much less than was said before, a few prices here, and you do science. And then when I have to give a lecture for this so-called Otto Negoli Prize, I use this painting, which I think reflects the best what is a clinician and the one who tried to be a scientist. A picture of Honey Magritte, that many of you have seen that. Why it resembles that? Because you, as a scientist or a clinician, you're seen by the clinician to do a surgery, not very, you're half a fish, half a human. So when you go into the science part, people will say, well, you're a clinician. You operate. How can you as good as us? And for many young people, when they go on the other side and to treat patients, they say, well, but you were in the laboratory. You cannot treat patients. And I remember uh, when I even apply and I try to fight all my life to have this so-called surgeon scientist, the one who contribute, at, 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 the, at, the, at the Spital Heart, yeah, at, the, at the University Heart, when I was trying to promote young people, one, one of the ladies stand up and asked me, but what do you want to do? I mean, you are here to be in the opting room. You are not here to do research. And I was completely shocked. That's something I would never heard in the US when there was more. And that has been a fight to try to say, well, in your reasonable way, you need to be on the science. You need to think out of the box. You need to be and a patient. And, and I lobby that's the best way, because you see it. And when I see the work you are doing, you are in the heart of the thing. I, I, I love the scientists, and of course we collaborate, but someone who's in the lab, never seen a patient, never seen a patient dying, never seen that, this is not the same incentive. Not going here and seeing a patient, the kids or whatever, dying, because you don't understand what's going on. Because you don't, and that is the huge incentive, to go and try to change and to go in the lab. You don't succeed very often, of course. You spend all your life to try to change, but that's the incentive behind doing that. And I just took a few pictures here, which raise a lot of emotion here. This is a young uh, lady. They came in from Albania here, and this young girl uh, was with it here in Zurich who had a large tumors of the pancreas, she was unoperable and qualified as being not operable by many. And then we decided with three other people to go and we did an operation, it's taking risk here, she was, uh, and we did an operation that lasted 12 hours and in the middle of the operation, we were not sure whether we could finish it and whether she would stay on the table. But there was really no other chance. We are lucky, we're not always lucky. This girl did very well, was lucky, she, she had chemotherapy after, very rare disease. And that's a picture I can tell you that give you all the incentive you need to go further and to do this. This is another example, I give a few examples to show you. For the patient, is the young ladies who are 20 years from Zurich, who had a, a disease that is pretty prevalent in Switzerland, that you have with the fox, and you can see in Zurich, you have a lot of fox, so be very careful. When you have a parasite, to go in your liver and kill you. And this is this young lady, 23, Swiss, never travel a lot, has this, I can show you, you can see that's the liver here, I don't have a pointer here, I can, that also doesn't work, but I can show that here. So you have here, that's here the, the liver, and here this is the cysts, which is on the top of the liver, and here you have on that side, that's the heart, and this cyst is going in the heart. And we have no medication, she's 23, and then you have to decide, and here we were also a bit out, 
of the box in this situation, and we remove, so we decided, and that's many teams, the cardiac surgeon, many teams to go here. We take risk, you take risk with the, the family here, and that's here what we did. This is the liver we took out, and you can see this cyst here uh, in the middle, so no chance you can do other things. Uh, we did that's the operation that was done with the cardiac surgeon. I'm unable to cannulate the heart, but here you have the people who cannulate the heart, and that's the liver afterward, and you can see this is not a very uh, healthy uh, liver in, in this situation. Uh, and then, that's an, I mean, that was, that was the, the, what did the living donor, because we could not have a, a liver from someone. So the sister, who was a little bit older, 26 years of age, gave half of her liver to her, and we transplanted, as I showed before. This is one of the picture here that we had. We celebrate here uh, one time, and we invite them. This is also not for glory or ego, although we have a little bit probably on this, but that's not the main. It's to favor organ donation. It's to motivate the people that here something is going out of the box. And I think this is a picture. This is the donor. You don't know which one <laughs> is what. In fact, the donor had a baby about a year ago. That's the incentive. That's, I think, what we are doing. And, and, and just people may think there is no money in that. We do it. There is no, we have to do transplant, which is normally as a salary, but there's absolutely nothing to do with any economic aspect in this. That's another short example here, but that's the last one here. You have a young woman, 21 pregnancy, first baby, bad luck. She has a fulminant hepatic failure, hepatitis B, which kill you usually in four days. And here uh, we decided, there has been about 30 such operations done, we decided to transplant her despite the baby. And when we spoke to the gynecologist, they said, well, do it, and then we'll see what happened to the baby. There's no way. So we did it. I go quick. We developed, there was also the research, some special technique here. We were pretty successful. She got her baby uh, here in 2012, and that's the picture we had before uh, <coughs> in one of the celebration of the organ donation. And that's a lot of emotion. That's just the top of the iceberg of what you can do in surgery and that we can motivate that. And here, then I learned a second part of things. There is something that can happen in your life and that many things, that can change many things. And for me, I was lucky to, uh, to have one patient, a well-known artist, in fact. I know nothing about his art. And then I became really a friend of him. I went very often in this atelier, and he teach me with a lot of conversation when you were very tired in the hospital. That happened very often with our administration. Don't repeat that. To, uh, and I was just leaving, go to Seyfeld, where he is, and I would spend two hours with him. And, uh, and he was always going, the hasard and la necessité. And that could be a topic, I think, in science, in biology. I have the impression that we can explain everything by chance and necessity, whether you meet people, whether you do a discovery, many is gone down. This man is uh, Gottfried Honegger, that maybe many of you may, may know. He died about a year ago uh, here, and uh, he redesigned part of the hospital. Uh, I was not specifically sharing his political uh, opinion. I know we talk about politics later on, but he convinced me about many things, and what it convinced me is about generosity and fighting for the people and fighting for the things that are important. There's some pictures that I show here with him, and in fact, one day I, I give you, a, I'll make a gift for you. Say, okay, what that is? Well, in your, in your canton, the Valais, I do something, and that's in, in haute nanda that's in the Valais. We inaugurate that, unfortunately, three months after he died. He died in January, and it was planned in April. The two daughters were here, etc. and that's one of his piece of art that is now uh, in one of the village uh, in the Valais, in the hospital with a lot of conversation about uh, the problem, this white room and all these things, and with some serious discussion again with the administration. We have these rooms, uh, which is going in line with concrete art that he was doing here, so we have several of these rooms with scholars. We even studied that a little bit to see the impact, and we even wrote a paper here that was published in one of the top uh, surgical journals two years ago about the effect of art on the surgical patient, and we did a review, meta-analysis, and we presented uh, this with number one, music clearly play a role. You can decrease the number of uh, anesthesia, different medication just by, by music and different things. And uh, here, so we have 
this, this, this study, I would not go along that, but it's been studied on, that in fact what, what looks better uh, uh, is useful or make life better. That's been here, this clearly if you live in that place it's probably better, and it was a study done uh, in a waiting room in pediatry here, uh, and see the impact on the, the right and the left uh, uh, waiting room about the patient and the study was here positive about anxiety, about many different things, including satisfaction for the doctor, which is not unimportant because that may certainly improve care. Now, I would finish here with a uh, uh, talk that I recently about trying to predict the future of surgery. And predicting the future is, of course, impossible. And I compare that a little bit to the car industry in this situation. And we have this curve here that you see, it's a biological curve that you have almost everything. You have flat, then something happened, and then you have a plateau at the end. And if we take the car industry, you have the car at the beginning of the century, then you have the Porsche, and then you there is some change, now we have the hybrid card, we, we have the card that would, would be go by the Google, and then we will fly. So right now we are here, probably in this curve of evolution, and speculation, in the car. We are much different with medicine. In medicine, that's where we think we are. We are starting today this car. We are not in the hybrid, we are not in the Google, we are just at the end, maybe, of the hand of the surgeon or whatever. Something is happening right now, and there will be you know, technology come and facilitate. We speak about robots. We don't have really a robot with a machine that helps us to operate. We're still fully responsible. We will have soon automatic stuff. There will be machine, a robot that will do a procedure better than any talented surgeon in the future, and we may even have at some point no need even for doctors when that comes that they will do the diagnosis, etc. There is database now that can analyze the literature on the disease in milliseconds, while it may take 30 years right now to do uh, with the, uh, the literature. So, no, what I think in, in medicine where we need to go lobbying is of course, innovation, but engineering is coming for us, and it's collaboration because we cannot go further without engineering. And I want to finish with a, 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 just a short movie here and maybe a link between uh, money, science, and whatever. Mr. Hans-Jörg Wies, that you maybe from you may know, in fact, is the, uh, the, um, the, the president, I think, of the Fondation Bayer in, uh, in Basel, make a lot of money in his life, and then he has decided to give back to the people and he has 22 billion, so he can give a fair amount of money back to the people, and he gave money in Zurich, and he's a visionary. He's a visionary because, I mean, you also see that in research there's a lot of waste, there's a lot of different things, and he say, we want to help the people, and that's where I think it goes, and where I want high-risk high risk research that makes sense, and that will benefit patients in a short period of time, and many of these things are dying because of money, because of, of startup, because of investment, which is extremely difficult, kill many projects because you're here in the middle and you have no money and you die, and uh, etc. So that he tried really, and you don't, but the project die. So he gave money here to do a project, that's one of the projects, it was four, we're lucky to have one of these projects, and he said it has to be done between the university and the ETH and all the other conditions. We were involved for many years in trying to regenerate livers, transplantations, and we were working on a machine. And here to get this, I had to find someone which is on the side of the street that will help us. That is the best things we've done uh, in my life because suddenly competence goes with competence with the same vision. This professor here, Philippe von Rohr, is a professor of the ETH. And since one year, we are working together. And I was just to show you this movie. And then it, I finish. Medicine meets engineering. This multidisciplinary team of engineers, physicians, and biologists is creating a special perfusion machine to keep a procured liver viable outside of the body. With the help of a surgeon, the liver is removed from the donor and connected to the machine. This device provides the liver with nutrients and oxygen, while monitoring its growth and functional capacity. Currently, the Liver for Life team is still working with pig livers. The ultimate aim is to regenerate liver tissue until it has reached sufficient size to be returned to the person from whom it was removed or transplanted to another patient waiting for a donor organ. 
The great challenge is to develop a long-term perfusion machine that can keep the liver tissue viable outside the body and to devise a method that allows for regeneration and growth. The fascination is, I would say, the biological aspect, which is new for me because you never know how it's really going to turn out. You always have the uncertain component of, of the biology, um, how the experiment will exactly turn out. It, it's never completely planable. I think the most important aspect of finding a common language is spending time together, uh, working together, being patient with each other when you explain something. Our experiments help us a lot when we spend multiple hours working on the same problem. And then you find a common language actually fairly quickly after a few months. Patients whose liver has been severely damaged by tumors may benefit from this therapeutic approach. Here on the, uh, what you have here, in fact that movie was done a year and a half ago now, we have done human, we've not transplanted yet, and here we have, may not see this is a normal, we show that to a pathologist, 10 days of a liver outside of the body. The, 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 the most successful up to date is about one day, and now we are 10 days, we can put a liver in that and we give to a pathology that doesn't always say the liver is normal. So this collaboration, working together, expertise, has changed a lot. I think I stop here so we can have a... a Thank you so much. Well, thank you for this fascinating um, presentation. And now I, I would like to, to have you talk together, to, to react for, to, to your presentation, to what you saw. Do you have any more questions to Thomas' art uh, practice as an artist? Well, I mean, uh, he doesn't know me, but I know him, of course, because an artist is more co known, and that's good. And, you know, but I think I'm very impressed when I just take two things. The first things that I see here, I mean, is, I think I mentioned before, is the enthusiasm, which is very important, what we call fire in the belly in our, in our world, and, and the commitment, the vision, and the, in, in doing something. I mean, I think this, I'm, I can get only pause, I'm, I'm really impressed. But what's going on? Of course, if we're looking from a scientific perspective, but what's common is the out of the box. I mean, you're going and you don't care what's, what's right or what's not right. You have your idea, you go for it. You want to, you go to Saskatoon for a good reason. I mean, it's not random that you go here, what you find, because you know here's a lot of, of, of Aboriginal, poor people, we know the problem and try to do that. Now, the, if we were a scientist, the question we would say, so just to challenge, because that's the goal, what's the impact? So you're going to these people, you show to the world, they are sensitive to that. If we were doing it in a scientific way, then the question is, what is the impact of your time you spend here, of having the lady that you show speaking and coming here, what's the results of that? Are you interested in the result? Are you trying to measure something? Or you are so convinced that you do not need someone to look at the outcome? Yes, the second, the second, I'm not interested in the result. I'm not interested in the impact. The only thing in, I'm interested in is in the dynamic and in the belief in art, that art as art can change a human being. That's what I believe. Yeah, thank you, my so, is not working. So. Uh, that's what I believe. That's, the, that's uh, not only what happened to me, by the way, but it's only what I think art can do. So, and I think it's very important today that this is not to measure. Because we are living, of course, in the world of everything is be measured. Everything must prove the impact. But, you know, go to a museum and engage um, a dialogue with an artwork. It cannot be measured. I'm thinking, for example, uh, you, you mentioned Gottfried Honecker. You go to a museum, you see a painting or a sculpture of Gottfried Honecker, Perhaps it touches you, perhaps it touches you so strong that it changed your life. Who can measure this when not you? So I insist on this point. I also insist, why? Because I show you there are some, for example, there are sometimes a lot of people, sometimes no people. It doesn't mean that it is a failure when nobody is here. The only failure would be, for example, for me in this project, if I would be not there. So. Uh, the problem is to escape this, um, uh, uh, this uh, uh, dictatorship of efficiency, of immediate efficiency, of measureship, or of, uh, uh, to prove impact. 
I think important is the belief and the affirmation of it. But, but still, in your in your work in, in your work, I mean, you improve the life of the people who participate in your projects. I mean, when when I saw the the, the movie about the Gramsci project, people seemed to be happy at least during the time the project was running. It's an improvement of their life. And you were very satisfied, I know you don't like Pauli, but we tell you, <laughs> by having the lady coming every day. You, you know, the next day when you came, I would challenge that you say, well, my project is a success. Because that person, obviously you understand, came back and contributed to the project by being integrated in your project. Of course, I like you, and that's a question I want to uh, ask you. Of course, like everybody, I think I prefer success than failure. But, um, <laughs> I, and uh, of course, I'm, I'm happy that my work makes happen. But even when it's not the case, I have to do it. So my question is, uh, um, and it's really something uh, you mentioned in the beginning, you know, that um, uh, to, make, uh, to, make, uh, to be a scientist, you have to confront uh, the mistakes you know, and make a lot of mistakes, perhaps. So, but, uh, but still, uh, you would not be here if you are not successful, no, professor? So now, tell me how you really deal with, uh, with this failure who happened to you, and how is, uh, how, how is a way to integrate them in a work, and perhaps at the global, to turn them in a, in, in a, in a kind of success? I think it's a, it's a great question. I think it goes all I mean, for us, we are realized as, a, as an artist, the only failure you decide yourself. I mean, if you do something, you don't like it, you, you discard that. And we know many artists that have destroyed many things. But with the end point we're using, you have a lot of success. Most of what you are doing, because it's, it's a success. For us, indeed, we are learning by failure. I mean, we mean, I think Einstein was saying, uh, did nine, 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 I don't know, 999 nine times wrong and a thousand times I was right. Uh, so one, one quality or one necessity, I think, in a scientist, I would say not to be crazy, but to be persistent. And this is difficult today, and that we are facing in the world also, is to be honest. Okay? There is a lot in the competition, in, in the, the America, uh, show that, that you need to be, to be honest with your data, what you have. So you have to accept your failure. Fortunately, sometimes failure are, if we say, publishable, because everybody expects something and you cannot show it, so you are contributing by showing this dogma is wrong, so you get the negative and the positive. But indeed, it's not an easy thing, and so that's also here in the mentorship, you have to learn. And if I show the first slides here, you know, you go in, a, in a, some of the big centers, etc., you, you, you think you, you authorize only to have success. With a patient, you must have success. We don't have always success, of course. And every time we fail, sometimes we learn with time that at the beginning we blame ourselves. We say, what I've done wrong, that's our reaction. What is this? And then there's many other factors in biology, etc. But one of the main, I, th I, th I think, character, I mean, and the main um, greatness maybe in a scientist is to be teach that many experiments I mean, are, are wrong. The hypothesis is wrong. Or what we found may, may very often, I think, Professor Agudzi, and I still touched that too, is that you start with a high, you have a world with a hypothesis, like you. You say, I'm going in a place, there is this and this, I'm, I'm, I don't want to speak for you. I go, I will be here, I do that, and people will appreciate, will be happy, this lady. So you have a hypothesis. In science, you need to have a hypothesis. If I do that, I will get this. I give this drug, nobody has done it, I do this. And very often, when you do this, you discover something else. And that's also the curiosity of going in one direction, and then you find something going in another direction. The best example is big, one of the biggest discoveries by a Swiss scientist, Jean-Francois Borel, who discovered cyclosporine, which is the drug that was permitted transplantation in the, in the <coughs> early 80s. He started with a drug for something completely different. It was an antibiotics. And in fact, his boss, his mentor, say, stop it, it doesn't work. And this young fellow thought, no, there's something strange, etc. and then he discovered a property that has never been found before, 10 years later, it permitted transplantation. That has been a huge, uh, a huge discovery. So you need to learn failure, you need to be critical with your data, and you learn from failure. And um, something else uh, related to this also is, uh, you mentioned already the box, but uh, um, you know, uh, I don't know, can you share this with me, but me as an artist, I'm an usual suspect. That means, 
uh, because I'm an artist, uh, uh, people are cr critic, uh, people are skeptical, people are doubtful. And um, uh, that's normal, that I can deal with this. It's not a problem. That 100%. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. Uh, I thought that's what I wanted. Are you usually, because I know we are usually suspect because we are the artists. So, um, can you, how does this, um, uh, in your practice, how, how can you see this, for example? How can you, um, we see it as artists, of course, um, that uh, the critic is made before the work is done, or, um, or uh, uh, there is, uh, there is uh, uh, no invitation, for example, or there is no exhibition, or there is no money for to do our work, because there is sub suspicion or, or, um, or doubt. So how it is, uh, how it is in your practice, and how you try to go over this sus suspect, sp suspectness, or usual suspect. I have the impression I can replace art by science, and we have exactly the same conversation. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, this is, by definition, by, by, by definition, I mean, we are suspect. I think the sapiens, so we are not really open for changes, right? Not very often. So that's what the scientists come, change things. And this is sometimes difficult. You have the competition. I know it art has competition. By us, there is a lot of competition on this. So you are human, so there's jealousy about many things, and people may react over that. And there is the money issue, as you mentioned, etc. And typically, the novel ideas are never accepted right away. If you look, for example, at citation, which is a marker of success, very wrong markers, and we can go also because we have wrong markers on our side. We want to if a metric for everything and of the time is wrong. Citation is one. If you look at many of the, the, the highly relevant discovery, we have changed the world in one way. They were completely ignored uh, from, from, from the beginning. And it takes about studying the 15, 25 years between an idea is done until there is some implementation. This is extremely well known. And I think a characteristic from a scientist is, is to have the, the courage to ignore this. Ignore completely this. And you may even go you know, on, on politics, because I know you're very engaged. We are engaged, or I'm engaged now in Switzerland in centralization. What is happening? We have too many hospitals in this country. We have too many people doing low number of procedures. Money is in the factors. And that is very concerning because patients may die from it. So we are going to our politicians to say you need to concentrate this uh, the big operation in some centers. Or impossible. This is basically so many interests around, so many suspicions that we are unable to to uh, to, uh, so to take advantage to prison. That I take an example: pancreas surgery. We do. We need in Switzerland for eight million people. We need that is very probably three to five centers. That's where we do the good work. We have 42. That's what we have. And you know, so that makes you also unpopular. And if you do science and you have a little bit of opinion, you can go out and you accept the criticism. They can say you are crazy, whatever. You don't understand uh, this issue. You don't understand the cantons. You don't understand this, etc. And then we go on the patient and say, okay, I'm sorry. This is what you are, what's relevant is in fact irrelevant. So we are also unpopular. Thank you. Can I ask you a question? Uh, you know, because you are a, a professor, a doctor who also do. Uh, you know, uh, chirurgy. So how this work? You are working in a team, there are a lot of people, no? Yeah. When there is an operation. So um, I suppose you are the, the chief or the director of, the, of this team who does this complex uh, organization. How this work? Do, do you, you know, there, there must be moments of decision very crucial, no? Between life and death or whatever. So how, how this, do you discuss? with the other doctors or with the anesthetists or, or sometimes are people telling you things or do you listen to what the other uh, is saying? How does this work practically? Well, that's different. I mean, today the, the, the system, which in fact was still in place in the a country a bit north of us, there is not one boss who knows everything. This is, not, this is gone. This is over. So now you specialize in an area, and you have different area, and you work in a team, which are not only surgeons. So for example, in my department, 
when I came here, which was new for this part, but it's very common in France, it's like that, or the US, I have to explain what I don't do, right? Because you specialize in something, and then you have other team doing. So for example, all the large bowel surgery, the, the, uh, the other fact, I don't do at all. So you have teams. So I think the goal of, uh, of someone now who's in charge is to have young, younger people often who are in charge, who don't even intervene in anything. So the, 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 the one who direct everything, this is dangerous, and I think it's gone in many places. Now, the crisis, yeah, I mean, you are human being, there are different behavior, there's different things going on. What do you do when you cannot control something? That's something you have basically to learn. You work in team, and, and maybe I, don't, I hope I don't do propaganda, but I have learned that. I don't do that, and that was the... the I remember he was the, a very famous surgeon. Each time there was something going out, he would put the finger bleeding, call someone, even someone much younger, asked to come and try to fix the problems. And that's really something we also try, try to do here is any time of crisis is to don't go into crisis and then it happen to call for help and to do it. That's, that's a very important uh, uh, factor for success in, in our profession. Mm. Maybe a question from my side. When, when, I, when I heard uh, Thomas Hirschhorn a couple of days ago uh, during a lecture you gave at the Schweizer Institute for Kunstwissenschaft, at one point, you said, well, there's, whatever I do, there's always problems, always a new problem, and another problem, and another problem. Everything is loaded with problems that I have constantly to solve all the time. You, you, you described it as kind of a general state of mind, learning to, to deal with problems. And I, I wonder if it's similar in research or, or then in, 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 the, in, the, in the operating room. What, what happens if problems arise? Who solves them? Or is, is that something that you can, that's a feeling that you can share? that something is always running, getting out of control, that you always have to, have to act immediately? The or question is, is for uh, Mr. Hirschhorn, no? Yeah. I mean, he explained, <laughs> but the question is for you. Is it, is it something similar that you well, feel I like... Well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, if you say there is the always time. problem, it's more an attitude than the reality, probably, in some way. To say, and that's a way to go around the problem or to prevent the problem and to say before there is the problems. I'm not sure what, I mean, you know, the, 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 we can dissect there is problem because the condition or the disease is complex, mm -hmm. you need multiple people to look at it. I'm not sure how to address, to address sure, every day, every, there was challenge, mm -hmm. and in a place like the university hospital, we get cases very often that no one else wants to deal with. Mm -hmm. The surgery with the girl you mentioned. Yeah, the, the, I mean, the surgery, I, I respect that. That surgery, I mean, that's where I say the ego, you need a bit yeah. ego, it's not completely negative. I mean, you have this long girl here, you have to go for it. I mean, you, I mean the, the right answer would be not to do it, right? Mm -hmm. That's a, you don't do it. You should not go for it. And you are not in trouble. Nobody will ever blame you to go. And here you go into that, uh, in this. Number one, you take, I took my best surgeon with me. We went that. We went to the pediatric hospital. And we went into that. And I can tell you that day, at the middle of the operation, I thought we would lose the kids on the table. Mm -hmm. It was okay if you want, even for the other, because they knew there was no chance for these kids. Mm -hmm. And in that experience, if things are well explained, even the family at the end, if you eat the catastrophe, they may even thank you to say, we tried, we were together, if you do the present well, mm -hmm. but this is not what you see. And in this situation, we were lucky, because if, despite all the tests, you are not totally sure. This disease has never, never existed in these small kids that we did it. So, yeah, that's a problem. You suffer. You go to war or whatever in this situation. You challenge your limit. You put your limit, uh, even though you've explained to everyone that things can happen. But yeah, well, I don't know if you want to do that for very long all your life, but I think this is something that push us forward in some, in some situation. The same thing for the transplant in these two girls at 22, you know, et cetera. You, you go for it. The right answer is not to do it. Mm -hmm. In but that's case, what you are doing. I mean, yeah, but in your case, the right answer would be to do it. You you fight for your project in 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 Beale right now. Yeah, but uh, of course you do. You do what cannot be done. No? Of course, you try to give form. By the way, problems. Uh, you you not try to give a solution, but you try to give a form to the problem. This is uh, our uh, my my work, my mission. Mm -hmm. I have, a small, I have a small question because a lot, I, mean, I know a bit your art. When you art, when you go here, look, you're in the heart of the people, the marginal people, the people who have no job, and you want to draw a bit cow or whatever. But I have the impression that it's very well prepared. So what you are showing, all these things, 
in your mind when we see all this decoration or what not decoration was going on, and it's well prepared, it's not random, or? No, of course, I do, I do uh, one week work with uh, assistants in the gallery to prepare this. Why do it? Because normally you can say, yeah, we can also put a table and a microphone and some chairs. No, I think the work has to be done first, that there is somebody who did the work. Who did? What you can do, what you don't need to do, what is too much to, to be done, what is also, um, in a way, um, um, a form of uh, to welcome the other to also do something, you know. Uh, I am a fan of this idea of, uh, of uh, Georges Bataille, the French philosopher, and uh, uh, mm, uh, the, his beautiful text of the um, notion of expenditure, who leads to, uh, to, to, by the way, the old idea of potlatch to, in an aggressive way, to give something in order to provoke the other to give more to you. So therefore, it is important to do the work, the, the surrounding work of the, of the workshop space. Yeah. What is the ideal uh, state of mind to be a good artist or scientist? I just wonder what, what kind of people become good artists or good scientists? What do they have in common? If it was so easy, there would be many more. <laughs> Would be good in your case, <laughs> and certainly also in yeah, Thomas' well, case. Good surgeons, good artists. I we can't have enough. Yeah, um, I don't know. I don't know. But um, I have, uh, if you mind, another question. What means this uh, high risk, the high risk? Uh, what means this, the high risk? In the end, you, um, you mentioned the word high risk um, or scientific. Or what it is? What is this high, high risk? Well, I mean, this is very, very important topic. I mean, I, when I want to know there is also what qualify a good surgeon who would have, is to be able to say no, right? So here I show cases of relatively benign disease, young people when we go, but you have other situation with patients with cancer where you have diffuse what whatever you do the prognosis is wrong, and here our job is not to hurt. So we are between taking the risk, and of course as a surgeon you appreciate when you take the risk. This is so a bit exciting, you go to something, you have a life and you succeed. I mean, that's extraordinary. But on the other hand, there is a very short way when you, we have to say mm. no, and that's also a big debate, and sometimes another topic here when money is involved, that's a problem, right? So here you really try to have uh, the balance between saying no and not. And you take risk also when you say no, because they may find someone else that has absolutely not the, the competence or the expertise to go on that patient. And that's sometimes one of the factors, do it because someone else will do it. And that's, I mean, that's another conversation, but uh, uh, you, you have to learn to say no. Uh, you mentioned something I was interested before. You mentioned uh, something you don't do. And my, me, my also, me also, I think, uh, um, we artists, we are judged, and I'm happy with uh, this, about what we are doing, yeah. always, yes? What we are doing, how it looks like, whatever. But there are a lot of things I don't do, yeah. you know, consciently. They're, and all artists also that I know, they don't know this, they don't know this. It's very important, I think, to do things, not, not to do some things, you know, in order to do the thing, you know? So uh, how is this in your... I'm sure you also so, know. Yeah. Okay, can you please tell me a little bit how, for uh, some examples, perhaps? I mean, this conversation, I think we can change out by science, and we have the same thing. I mean, this is exactly that. The people don't know what you don't know, what you say no, when you don't want to go for it, and where you take risk. And that has to do certainly by, by experience, by the team, etc. And the people, of course, they don't know uh, when you say no. They, they, they don't know. They would may I can that's a today. I can show you the success. Oh, that's great. I did these cases, but I can should show the 50 cases that we we could have taken out the tumor even easily, but you are not helping the patient at all. The opposite because they cannot get chemotherapy or whatever. So that's absolutely clear. That of course nobody knows in this. But that maybe should be for us more in the balance. Uh, and when you evaluate uh, a center or whatever, that could be in the balance to say, well, tell us what you have not done, because here you may also judge, because we are judged of the uh, quality of what I, and that's really in the balance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're a little bit running out of time. Uh, um, Thomas, your uh, presentation was called What Can I Learn From You, the project in, in Canada? What Can You Learn From Me? Maybe uh, a last question from my side. Um, um, 
What do you think could you learn from each other? Could you, could you give a, a very specific answer? What have you learned from Thomas the last hour? Is there anything that you can take with you? Yeah, I will take a lot. No, I don't try just to have, I think I will take a lot. You mentioned his intuition. I think I mentioned that, I have the impression that I will repeat uh, myself. I think what, what I have learned is conviction, the, the fire in the belly, the enthusiasm. Mm. What I have learned is, uh, maybe it's not so different, is that if I, you don't care about the outcome. What you do, you, you plan it, you do it, and that's it. And then you go away from that and you expect something from that. For us, of course, this is, would be about the opposite, but very often we don't know what to measure. And that's the question. What do you measure? Happiness? Uh, the good statistic, uh, a blood test that you have done, and that's a big question in terms of where we are going. So, although we pretend that what we do need to be, I mean, you know, so the wedding, a baby, of course it's a success, etc. But that's what I learned, and that would mimic to think a little bit about uh, what really is the metric, what we need to look at. Mm -hmm. uh, Thomas? Yeah, what I learned, and I, I must um, say thank you for showing the pictures of the people. Because even when it seems very, very um, uh, simple, I like that even for you, professor, uh, that, uh, yeah, it's about life and death, it's about people, it's about the next. Too, because yeah. what I think is something really interesting in your, uh, I think in your profession is that you're working with people you don't know. You don't know. It's just a, a human being, the next, but in a one moment it's the next to you. And I liked that you... Uh, you put these pictures to show your, as you mentioned, your incentive mm -hmm. and that I learned uh, today from you. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for listening to this talk. Thank you, uh, Pierre-Alain Clavien. Thank you, Thomas Hirschhorn. Thank you all for listening today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>